Greetings class and welcome back. Today we'll be discussing process strategies. We're also going to be uh, discussing capacity and constraints management and lastly location strategies. Process strategy is an interesting uh, concept. It's the objective. The objective of it is to create a process to produce offerings that meet customer requirements within cost and other managerial constraints. We know it because we constantly do processes within our organization. Every process itself has to have an objective, an end state. Uh, it creates something, uh, a service, provides a service, or it creates an object of some sort in production. Now, in the process strategy, we learn how to produce a product or provide a service that meets or exceeds customers' requirements. It meets the cost and managerial goals. It's important to understand these two because if we don't meet the managerial goals and, of course, the costs, you know, do it within cost, we'll be in financial distress. And if we, not, we don't meet the, or exceed the customer's expectations or requirements, we will not be able to sell the products. We also look at how you know, has long-term effects on the process strategy will have long-term effects on the efficiencies and production flexibility of the organization and, of course, the cost and the quality of the same. Now, there are four basic strategies in the process strategies. There's process focus, repetitive focus, product focus, and mass customization. Within these basic strategies, there are many ways that they may be implemented. Let's look at process, volume, and variety type of uh, concepts. In, the, in, in here, what we're looking at is we're looking at the four basic functions being process focused are those that are for projects, job shops, such as machines, uh, printing, hospitals, restaurants, etc. We also look at uh, items that we do repetitively, production, ske production schedules that are repetitive in nature, such as autos, motorcycles, home appliances, etc. And in fact, if you read your book, uh, the textbook, you would see uh, Harley Davidson is an example of a repetitive product, and the Arnold Palmer Hospital is an example of the process focus. Now, for product focus, we look at commercial, uh, commercially baked goods, uh, steel, that's another one, glass, beer, etc. Uh, and an example of product focus would be Frito Lays. Then we also, lastly, we have mass customization. Here we have difficult to achieve, but huge rewards. And an example of a mass customization is Dell computers. Now, when you look at these, you realize that their variety, if it's a high variety, but you have low volume, it is low, it is a process focus. So high variety, low volume is process focus. If you have where the variety changes in modules, you know, mo modest run standardized modules, then what you have is, is uh, and, it, and it's a repetitive process, it's the volume type is in the middle, then you have a repetitive process, uh, like, the, like we just mentioned, automobiles, uh, auto, you know, motorcycles, etc. Now, if it changes in attributes, such as in grade, quality, size, thickness, etc., long runs only, but it's also high volume, like the mass, like the Dell computers, or correction, like the Frito Lays, then you have the product focus. If you lastly have high variety, but mass customization, that's where the Dell product comes in. That's where it is difficult to achieve, but huge rewards in there, and that's what Dell does. There's a thing called a poor strategy. Uh, these are where both fixed costs and variable costs are high. And in these areas where it's poor strategy, um, it's sometimes effective, where if you go into the strategy, but it's, if you do it the wrong way, it's going to be catastrophic at some point. So poor strategies are usually those that are not, uh, not used only in circumstances that are uh, exemplary for the organization to take to make income at that specific point in time. Then they switch back immediately to either high variety type products or you know, changes in attributes, etc. Now, process focus continues by, you know, we continue with process focus by saying that facilities 
are organized around specific activities and processes. Generally, you know, there are general purposes, equipment, and skilled personnel are needed in them. There is a high degree of product flexibility. That's, that's an important aspect to understand. Typically, these are high cost and low equipment utilization, and product flows may vary, considerably making planning and scheduling a challenge. That's the process focus. The process focus stems in the, like I mentioned, like I mentioned before, low volume, high variety, intermittent processes, etc. These are where you have many inputs. For example, let's say the Arnold Palmer Hospital, you will go ahead and have surgery, sick patients, baby deliveries, emergencies that are popping in and they come in and they go into the various areas. Then there are many departments that uh, are involved in many routings that are taking place, uh, radiological, you know, where you have your blood drawn, all of this information is now gathered by the doctors to make decisions and then take actions to save patients and make them healthy and well. And, well. Uh, and there's, there's many output types that go out there. The repetitive focus are facilities often organized as assembly lines, characterized by modules with parts and assemblies made previously. The modules may be combined for many output uh, options itself. There is less flexibility than process-focused facilities, but it's more efficient. When we look at the repetitive focus and we look at the Hardy-Davidson, we know that it's modular. And what happens is, is you have raw materials and module inputs coming in, uh, such as you know the various engine models that are in there, and then wheel modules and the framing may be slightly different, etc. And then they come in. Uh, you then put them into production and you assemble them, and then of course you have various types coming out, various type of motorcycles coming out. In the product work focus, we deal with facilities that are organized by product, high volume but low variety of product. Long, continuous production runs enable efficient processes and maximize financial returns. Typically, high fixed cost but low variable cost, and generally less skilled labor. Product focus, the example we provided to you was Frito-Lays, and what happens is you have few inputs like corn, potatoes, water, seasoning, you mix it all up, and you produce the chips. Out comes the various sizes. <coughs> Excuse me. Out comes the various sizes and shapes and packaging. Mass customization is the rapid, low-cost production of goods and services to satisfy increasing unique customer desires. Combines the flexibility of a process focus with efficiencies of a product focus. We mentioned mass customization. An example is the Dell computer. These are a combination of many parts and components, such as the chips, hard drives, software, and the cases that they come in, they put them together, and out comes the various types of Dell PCs that you requested. Mass customization is imaginative product design, flexible process design, tightly controlled inventory management, tight schedules, responsive partners in the supply chain. We also have the crossover uh, example that we have to go ahead and provide you because we want to find out where the crossover points are. And the example we're going to try to give you is to evaluate three different accounting software products. So I used to be an accountant and uh, you know, at that point it was very important to have software products because if not, you'd be doing it by pencil and paper. Uh, so when, the, when it first came out, we ended up having the rudimentary type uh, DOS manipulated systems. We didn't have WYSIWYG or any of that stuff that we currently have now. But it was an important aspect because it was the beginning of the Excel spreadsheet, believe it or not. And it wasn't Excel back then, it was Lotus 1, 2, 3. So you can, I just dated myself and you can see how far we've come along in the short time. But let's calculate the three different accounting software products and calculate crossover points between software A, B, and between B and C. So let us assume that software A has a cross has a total fixed cost. Remember, you got to figure out what the total fixed cost is and the dollars required for accounting to the accounting report. So total fixed cost for software A is $200, software B is $300,000, and software C is $400,000. So let's recap. Software A is $200,000, B $300,000, C $400,000. Very simple to remember. Then the dollar required for accounting reports 
for a software A is 60, for a software B is 25, and for a software C is 10. So far, very simple. So what do we do in order to figure this thing out? Well, we got to see you know, where the crossover point is. This becomes a general algebraic equation, whereby you're trying to figure out where is it that A and B, and then B and C become equal. So you go ahead and put the formula, which is your 200,000 plus 60, which remember is $60, times V, which is your variable cost, and equals 300,000 plus 25 times V, which is your variable cost of that. When we solve the, for the algebraic equation, you end up having 35 V equals 100,000. V becomes 2,857. Consequently, the software A is most economical from zero to 2,857 read fourth. Remember this because at this point, you're gonna, this is gonna make you look a shining star in your organization because you're now telling people where two products, two, two distinct products, in this case, the example of software, become equal in nature. That's where the crossover occurs. Then afterwards, they do inverse. They actually do crossing each to itself. Now let's look at software B. Software B is also most economical from 2,857 to 6,666 reports. Why? Well, you, you go ahead and put the 300,000 plus the 25 uh, times the variable cost, you know, the second variable cost, and that's equal 400,000 plus 10 times the variable cost. When you solve the algebraic equation, it gives you 15 times V, where the variable cost equals 100,000. You solve for V, and the second variable cost is 6,666. Simple math, right? But now you understand what, you know, the, the actual points where they become most economical. A, from zero to 2,857, and software B, from 2,857 to 6,666 reports. Consequently, what you have is in the low volume area, you notice that your fix for process A, you would notice that your fixed costs are less and your variable costs increase. And as they move forward, to process B, fixed costs increase, variable costs decrease, and then process C would have the highest number of fixed costs, but has the lowest quantity of variable costs. So when you put this in a regular ordinary XY chart, you'll see that your when you when you bring in the information, you'll notice that your fixed cost goes from two hundred thousand and has a, a upward going slope of about you know sixty percent on or about. You then have a total process for B, and that would from 300,000, and that would have a forward slope of about 45. And then C, that would go start from 400,000 and has a 35% slope on there, moving from left to right. And then where do they cross over is the numbers that we just spoke about. You know, it's very, very interesting uh, concept, and um, it's, it, but it's fun to do, but at the same time, it's very informative to know when these crossover points are so you know when to produce at what point. The next thing we will be talking about is capacity management. And capacity management in itself is a, an important aspect of when, when things are to be occurring. When do you want to produce? So what you're looking at is the definition of capacity would end up being the throughput of the number of units a facility can hold, receive, store, or produce in a period of time. That's what it is. Determines fixed cost. So capacity will determine what your fixed cost is. It determines if demand will be satisfied. And we use three times, three time horizons. Now, we want you to understand that there are little concepts in here we're going to be talking about, which are like bottleneck analysis, theory of constraints, the break-even analysis, and reducing risk with incremental changes. Applying, one of the things we have to also understand is that um, we want to apply, in order to, to find these, in, this information out, the expected monetary value to capacity decisions. Now, expected monetary value is shortened into EMV. 
applying investment analysis to strategy-driven investment is another item that we like to do. When you combine the EMB and the strategy-driven investments, you come up with a pretty, pretty good decision-making process. You know, when it comes to uh, understanding what we're trying to do. So let's look at capacity. That's one of the first things we want to solve for. The throughput or the number of units a facility can hold, receive, or store. We identify then what your plan you're planning over a time horizon. Where do all of this capacity you know, to be had and for what period of time? There are three time horizons. Remember, I mentioned that just, just a few uh, seconds ago. Well, we're looking at the long term, long range planning. All right. Uh, these are for designs you know, of new products. We add or sell existing long lead time equipment, acquire or sell facilities, and acquire com competitors. It's not easy, you know, for you know, thinking forward because you have to have capital. So you have, you have to be generating the capital prior to and deciding when to go ahead and initiate the decision making process of buying competitors or acquiring them, merging or, where they become the miner, uh, acquiring cell facilities, etc. Then there's the intermediate range planning. This is called aggregate planning. Here we subcontract, we add or sell equipment, add or reduce shifts. We also build or use inventory, more, more uh, or improved training. So we either increase the training, the more, or we improve the quality of the training itself. And we add or reduce personnel. The last one being short range planning, which is also scheduling. And here's when we schedule jobs, schedule personnel, allocate machinery, et cetera. Most of us will deal with the short range planning. Right. It's difficult to adjust capacity as limited options exist at these points. So there's two times that this occurs where it's, you have, we have limited option to adjust. And that is at the long range planning and at the short range planning. The reason for that is this, in the long range planning, you are thinking in the future and you are going to modify your, your entire framework of the organization around these new objectives, but you have to come up with the financing. In the short range plan, your budget has already been cycled and approved. So when you have to be flexible, unless your budget has a large and robust reserve, which many a lot of budgets don't, uh, then you're stuck with the scheduling of jobs, et cetera. So you have some leeway, but it's difficult to adjust capacity because you're limited. You're, you have a limited option. Now, how to design an effective capacity? The first thing you have to understand is what the definition of design capacity is, and that is the maximum theoretical output of a system. And it's normally expressed in some form of rate. So in a rate, that means you have to have a numerator and a denominator. All right, so just remember that. Effective capacity is capacity a firm expects to achieve given current operating constraints, often lower than design capacity. So let's talk a bit about utilization. Utilization is the percent of design capacity actually achieved. Again, you're going to have a numerator and a denominator. What does it mean? Well, utilization is actual output divided by design capacity. Remember that formula. Efficiency is the percent of effective capacity actually achieved. So it's usually a, an efficiency rating. So you look at, okay, what's the efficiency rating of X, Y, whatever. Usually we look at air conditioning as efficiency rating, or we look at efficiency rating for um, electrical products, et cetera, like a refrigerator. But you can use this for efficiency rating for almost anything. As long as you have an actual output and you know your effective capacity. When you divide actual output by the effective capacity, you're, you now know the rate of efficiency. Let me give you an example. And this is an example for design capacity. Let's say you have a bakery right? and you're trying to go ahead and find out what the design capacity is for your bakery. Well, let's, uh, let us make the following assertions that you have in your bakery on a normal basis. Your weekly actual production is 148,000 rolls, all right? Fairly large bakery. Your effective capacity given is 175,000 rows. 
So we have an actual of 148,000 and you have an effective capacity of 175,000. Your design capacity is 1,200 rows per hour. Your bakery operates seven days a week, three to eight hour shifts. All right, so how do we calculate design capacity? Not fairly simple. How many days are there? How many days does your bakery operate? Well, seven. All right, so, okay, we have seven. Now, how many shifts, hour shifts are there? Hour, yeah, hour shifts. You have three, all right, and eight. So you have three and eight hour shifts. So you multiply seven days a week, all right, times three times eight hour shifts. So you're working 24 hours a day is what you're baking. Basically, your your bakery is working, and three shifts of eight hours each. Consequently, when you multiply that times your design capacity of 1,200 rolls per hour, you come up with 2,000, 200 and 1,600 rolls. That's your design capacity for the week. Okay, very simple math. But now let's try to figure out what's your utilization rate. All right, so what you do now is for the utilization rate is you take your actual productions for last week or 148,000 rolls. That was the first number that we said. And you divide that by the design capacity, which we cal just finished calculating it at 201,600 rolls. That gives you a utilization rate of 73.4%. Not bad. Is there room for improvement? Sure, you can reach up all the way up to 100% utilization rate. Can you go beyond that capacity? Can you have capacity greater than 100%? Yes, you can. All right. But it all depends if your machinery can actually perform it or take it. There are some that cannot. There are some that can't. I've seen I've seen uh, manufacturing where capacity rates 120% of the money. So. It's, it's just how to sequence it and, it, and it does put stress on the, the production line, but if you need to do it for emergency purposes or it's very lucrative, then you would do it. Now let's talk about the, the actual efficiency. We look at the, the actual production last week, of last week which is 148,000 rolls, and the effective capacity of 175,000 rolls. When you divide the 148, 148,000 by 175,000, you get an efficiency rating of 84.6%. Now let's look at design capacity. We continue with the bigger example, of course. Um, remember that your actual production last week was 148,000. Your effective capacity was 175,000 rolls. Your design capacity, we calculated at 201,600 rolls per line. And your efficiency rating was 84.6%. And your expected output of new line is 130,000 rolls. All right, so we got that information. So how do we look at design capacity? Well, or how do you calculate design capacity? You take the 201,600 rolls per line, that's your design capacity, multiply it times two, all right, and you get 403,200 rolls. Now, how do you calculate your effective capacity? Well, you do the 175,000 rolls times two, because you're increasing everything. What happens if you double? And it's 350,000. And in your actual capacity, you add the 148,000 plus your 130,000 and gives you 278,000 rolls. That's your actual output. How do you calculate your utilization right here? All right, well, in this case, you have 278,000 divided by, because remember, that's your actual output, 278,000 rolls, divided by 403,200, which we calculated was your design capacity at double, at double the size. That gives you 68,000 or 68.95%. And your efficiency is 278,000 divided by 350,000, giving you 79.43%.
right? Now you could, fo you could follow this, uh, you could identify this in your book because the example is in your book. Let's talk a little bit about capacity and strategy. Capacity decisions impact all 10 decisions of operations management, as well as other functional areas of the organization. Capacity decisions must be integrated into organization's mission and strategy. Fail to do that, and then you may go off track. Capacity considerations include forecast demand accurately, match technology increments and sales volume, find the optimum operating size volume, build for change. Now, what are some of the tactics for matching capacity to demand? The first one is making staff changes. Normally, when I come into a business and I have to go into you know, matching capacity to demand, I look at how do I make it more efficient? So staff changes is the first thing I look at to see. Sometimes I have to do it, sometimes it's not warranted. Adjusting equipment is another, purchasing additional machinery or selling or leasing out existing equipment. Another thing you can do is you can also look at where your products are located within the assembly line. You may want to move them around so that they can go ahead and be less time for an employee to take an a equipment from one one station to another. This is improving processes to increase throughput. The other one is redesigning the you know, products to facilitate more throughput. Uh, another one is adding process flexibility to meet changing product preferences. And of course, you may have to close facilities. Remember I spoke about bottlenecks and that's exactly what it, what, what it sounds like, it's what it is. You know, a bottleneck is when you have constraints of your capacity, you're limited by the amount that you can push through because there's one area of the flow uh, that is not allowing you to push more than what you, that you've reached capacity at that, in that bottleneck area. Each work area can have its own unique capacity. So you can have area A making 100,000 widgets. Area B has a throughput of it from area A that, ha that gives you the 100,000 widgets. So your capacity is 100% of A can go through B but unfortunately, C only has a capacity of 50%. So that means it would take you double the amount of time to throughput the 100,000 that you started off with A through B to get to D because C, your bottleneck, is 50,000 units of capacity of processing. Capacity analysis determines the throughput capacity of workstations in a system. A bottleneck is just a limiting factor or constraint. That's the lowest effective capacity in a system. And the time to produce a unit or a specialized batch size is the process time. Now, if we look at the bottleneck time, what is that bottleneck time? Well, that's the time of a, the slowest workstation, the one that takes the longest in a product, in a production system. The throughput time is the time it takes a unit to go through production from start to the end with no waiting. All right, so Back to the example of A, B, and C. Um, but instead of using the amount of product, let's use time. So from A, it takes you to it takes to produce two minute two minutes per unit. It goes through to B. It takes B four minutes per unit. And then it goes to C, and the final production is three minutes per unit to finalize. When you add up all these times, two plus four is six. All right, plus three is nine. So the total time is nine minutes. But it doesn't matter how many you produce in A at two minutes because B can only process one item at four minutes each. So it takes double the time. And then when you go from B to C, it's three minutes. That's, it's important to understand capacity, the capacity itself. So let's look at two identical, uh, let's go with, a sandwich line, right? Um, so let's go to subways, etc. Let's assume that subway has two sandwich lines versus a traditional one line with multiple employees trying to trying to grab from the same product system. You have two identical sandwich lines. The lines have two workers and three operations, and all completed sandwiches are wrapped, just like you know subways. Right? The first thing is the order. 
How long does the order take? Well, the average order, it takes about 30 seconds. Why? Because people look, they didn't make up their mind. After waiting in a line, that's another, that's another uh, thing that we can, we can talk about is line analysis. But usually people wait in the line, they talk, etc. When they get to the line, don't you just love it? They, they, they can't figure out what they want. Unfortunately, there, or uh, that's unfortunate, but fortunately, there are others that already know what they want to order, and that's quick and pissed. Yeah, so, yeah, the Italian herb, you know, the Italian uh, herb and cheese, that's it. I, I already know my sandwich. So six inch Italian herb and cheese, and we'll go ahead with the, with the turkey. Yes, I want lettuce, tomato, you know, lettuce, tomatoes, pickles, uh, onions, and but no salt, no pepper, and oil, yes, uh, and uh, no vinegar. I already know what I want, so I just rattle it off and off they go. But people make decisions. So 30 seconds per sandwich is for the order. Now, from there, it goes to two, two areas. So everybody comes in one line, they split into two. It takes 15 seconds per sandwich on both sides. It takes 20 seconds per sandwich to do the fill. And it takes the toaster 40 seconds per sandwich. It's the same thing. Then comes the wrapping station. It takes 37.5 seconds per sandwich and a deliver it to the customer right there. In other words, hand it to the customer. The issue at hand is this. When you have these two assembly lines, you think you're going to be able to go ahead and increase the output. You will, but not at double the amount. Why? Well, you're still limited to the first order, which is the ordering of 30 second sandwiches, and you're stuck with the one person doing all the wrapping which is 37.5, you only have one station, 37.5 seconds per sandwich. So let's look at the capacity analysis. The two lines are identical, so parallel processing can occur. At 40 seconds, which is where you do the toasting, the toaster has the longest processing time and it's considered the bottleneck for each of the lines. At 40 seconds for two sandwiches, the bottleneck time of the combined line equals 20 seconds. Got it? So it's 40 seconds divided by two combined lines, 20 seconds. Now the wrapping at 37.5 seconds, the wrapping and delivery is the bottleneck for the entire operation. So let's calculate the capacity. Capacity per hour, let's say, was 3,600 seconds. All right. Why? Because you're adding the seconds up and you're multiplying it. You know, for it. So you get 3,600 seconds. You're multiplying times the hour. Do you divide that by the total amount of time that it takes to do the wrapping, or 37.5 seconds? That tells you that your seconds per sandwich is 96 sandwiches per hour. It doesn't matter how much you increase. You can even have more lines, and you'll see that you have diminishing the returns because you only have one wrapping station. So when you calculate capacity, you have to understand where the bottlenecks are. Your throughput time, though, would be 30 seconds, which is your order, 15 seconds, which is the bread, 20 seconds is the fill, and 40 seconds, which is the, the toasting. Then you add the 37 and a half seconds for the wrapping, and you get a total of 142.5 seconds of throughput time. Now, standard process for cleaning tea. Everybody's gone to the dentist. Let's talk a little bit about how to figure out how to do the capacity analysis for the cleaning teeth program. Cleaning and examining the x-rays can happen simultaneously. So that's, that is the, uh, the one assumption that you have, and it's a fact. It can happen. So how do you do this? Well, you check in, like all of us do. Check in, fill out the paperwork, et cetera, okay? All right. Some of there's new tech, there's new methodology now that you can actually use an app. You go to the app and you tell them a lot about yourself. So you're actually pre-filling before you even get to the office. You're pre-filling all of this. That is excellent time management and, and using automation to your advantage in, in in the in the medical field. You enter, you check in, everything's fine. We need to the X-ray area and you either take a scan or a panoramic view of your teeth. That takes about two minutes per unit, per person. And you gotta go to develop. Now, in today's technology, the development is almost instantaneous because it goes from the x-ray to digitization, straight to 
the screen, they, uh, the technician reviews it for any anomalies or imperfections, um, not of the teeth, but of the, of the actual uh, x-ray itself. Once it's, a, it's okay, then it, they save it and they forward it over to the doctor and the hygienist, all right? Well, not to the hygienist, to the doctor. The hygienist then performs the clean. It takes 24 minutes per person. The examination of the x-ray takes five minutes per unit or per person. Then you go to the hygienist and a cleaning to the dentist. So the dentist then looks at it for eight minutes, you know, looks at, you know, talks with you and discusses things with you for eight minutes. And then your checkout time is six because you got to pay. Right? And of course, future consultation. So now let's look at what, what this process entails. All possible paths must be compared. That's the first step. The next is the bottleneck. Let's identify where the bottleneck is. Well, the bottleneck, it happens to this place, in this case, to be the hygienist because it takes 24 minutes. The hourly capacity then would be 60, 60 minutes, divided by 24 or two and a half patients per hour. X-ray exam path is two, which is the two minutes of check-in, plus two, which is your two minutes of taking the X-ray, plus four, which is developing the X-ray, plus five, which is the X-ray exam itself, and eight, which is the dentist, and finally the checkout, 27. The cleaning, on the other hand, is the same, except, all right, you go to the hygienist and it takes you 24 minutes, and then you substitute everything, you, you keep everything the same, it takes you 46 minutes for cleaning the teeth. Now, granted, you want the hygienist to take, you know, his or her time doing the cleaning of the teeth and to be, you know, professional and at the same time ensure that your teeth are perfectly clean with minimal uh, causing of lacerations to the gums. All right, so you want the hygienist to, you know, be careful and take take his or her time. But the longest path involved is the hygienist and cleaning the teeth. Patients should, com should complete in 46 minutes. So let's look at, once you understand that, you, now you understand where the bottlenecks are and what do you have to live with if you, uh, or if you want to change something. Uh, is there a new design where you can actually clean teeth faster? Do you do it the traditional way? Or do you use water picks? Or, you know, whatever is the appropriate methodology. If it increases the time that it takes, you can have more pe more patients coming in. You can actually make more money. But sometimes you have you have just reached maximum capacity, and there's nothing you can do about it until new technology comes in. Let's look at breakeven analysis because it's you know we now know that we have throughputs, we have bottlenecks, you know, but how do we determine uh, break-even analysis? The first thing is we look at, it's what is a break-even analysis? Well, it's a technique for evaluating a process and equipment altern alternatives itself. The objective is to find a point in dollars and units at which cost equals revenue. Aha, cost equals revenue. That means you're actually breaking even. That's why the analysis requires estimation of fixed costs. For example, you're going to look fixed costs, you're going to look variable costs, and you're going to look at revenues. Those are the three variables that you're going to try to look at. Now, what are fixed costs? I mean, we look at it from an accounting perspective. If you remember when we took your accounting, you could go ahead and say, okay, fixed costs are costs that continue even if no units are produced. That's fixed costs. It's usually a plant you bought, you have a plant, you bought it, you own it, you're paying a mortgage on it. No matter what, you're paying the mortgage on it. Whether you produce or you don't produce, you're paying. The same thing with insurance. Those are fixed costs annually. You're paying. Whether you produce or you don't produce, you're paying. Other things as, for example, two things you're guaranteed in life. One is everybody's going to die. And the other thing is everybody's going to pay taxes. So what is a fixed cost? Taxes. For that particular year, your taxes are set by the, by the county appraiser's office as your military, you are going to pay that tax based on the value of your property. They do an evaluation of your property, you got it. Next thing is depreciation. Your accountant, if you bought the building at the beginning when you first bought it, 
he, the accountant's going to come up, he or she, and say, okay, do we do double declining balance? Do we do a straight depreciation schedule of 29 and a half or 30, 30 years? You know, it, it all depends on your account. You got to talk to the account to figure out what your depreciation schedule is for equipment, depending on the, the cost of it, whether you're going to depreciate it or cost it out. Debt, you're going to pay. Mortgages, payments, we talked about that. Variable costs, the next thing we got to talk about. These are costs that vary with the, with the volume of the units produced, such as labor, materials. The more you produce, the more material you're going to use, so that's a variable cost. Portions of utilities. The more electricity you consume, the more you're going to pay. There's certain electricity that is constant uh, that you're going to be actually paying all the time, no matter what, even if you don't produce anything. Contribution is the difference between selling price and variable cost. Remember this because there's a thing called contribution margin. Right? So you're going to have to remember that your contribution is the difference between your selling price and your variable cost. You also going to have to find out the revenue function. So the revenue function begins at the origin and proceeds upward to the right, increasing by the selling price of each unit. This is where the revenue function crosses the total cost line is the break-even point. We have that. This is, you know, so if we have the revenue function, that is where it begins at the origin and proceeds upward and to the right. So you have to start at the bottom, at the very crux where the X and Y axis meet, and it goes up. Now, depending on the level of revenue function, is to your, your actual, um, whether the slope is higher or lower. When the revenue function crosses, the total cost line, that's your break-even point. And what is total cost line? Variable and fixed. Now, when you have your total revenue line crossing the total cost line, we've already said that's the break-even point where your total cost equals total revenue. If it goes above, in other words, if your total revenue crosses over and goes above the total cost line, what is that? Lo and behold, that's your profit quarter. That's where you're making money. So the, you know, the, the moral of the story over here on break-even analysis is once you compute your break-even point, you, try to go, you have to go over it in order to have some type of profit. Now, Let's look at some assumptions of break-even analysis because it's, 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 you have to understand it is a linear function. Cost and revenues are considered linear functions. Is that true? Well, it depends. There are some organizations that have linear function uh, as revenues. There are others that don't. For example, in my organization, in, in, in the uh, credit union, we don't have a linear function. We have seasonal trends. We can do exponential smoothing to go ahead and make that into a linear function and more readily available for break-even analysis. But the reality of the show is, is if we use the linear function, we normally don't have a good analysis of break-even points. So we look at break-even points incrementally instead of aggregate at, in, in my organization. Uh, but in in a typical manufacturing or typical service industry where there is a constant flow, then yes, it, the linear functions occur. This is generally not the case as I just described, but at the same time, it is useful because at that point, it gives you something to work with. Now, we actually know the cost and it goes back in time. So we know what the actual fixed cost is for now, for present, and what it was in the past. Will the break-even point change in the future? Of course, everything changes. And, you know, so will fixed costs change depending if you have contracted? Sometimes it, it, does, it changes from year to year if you have one of your contracts. But if you don't for the fixed cost, they usually stand. Like your mortgages would usually uh, stay sta you know, static for the 30 years if you have a fixed, fixed uh, mortgage rate. Uh, or uh, usually... For businesses, the, the loans are usually 15 years, 10 years, depending on what, you're, what you were given. But we know these costs. That's the important thing here. Time value of money is another thing that we have to understand, but it's often ignored. 
when we do the breaking even analysis. Why? Because we're trying to keep it simple. That's all. Can you do the break-even analysis? Absolutely. So now let's look at some definitions here. The what we call the BEP X or break-even point X. That's that means it is the break-even point in units. So BEP X is break-even points in units. Let's remember that. The next one is break-even point S. All right. And well, it's the actual the dollar sign. It's break-even point dollar sign. And that's the break-even point in dollars. So you have break-even point in units and break-even point in dollars. P is the price per unit. And that's after all the discount. Your X is the number of units produced. Your capital T, capital R is total revenue, which is also, you know, capital P, little x. Your F is fixed cost. Your V is variable cost per unit. And your TC, capital T, capital C is total cost. Total cost is also equals to your fixed cost plus variable cost. All right, so remember that. Always remember, total cost is fixed cost plus variable cost. If you know that little formula, life will be a lot simpler and smoother for you in developing all of these wonderful analysis and stuff. So when does the break-even point well, occur? Well, we just said it's when your total revenue equals your total cost, correct? Or when your P, little x, equals your total cost, which is your F, your fixed cost, plus your variable cost in units. All right. Now your BEPX would end up being, or your break-even point in units would end up being your fixed cost divided by all right, your price per unit, after all the discounts, minus your variable cost per unit. Can this be found out? Of course it can. All right. Now, once you figure that out, now you know how many units you have to you have to make in order to break even. And of course, that's your target point to go above it. So if your total break even point in units was a thousand units per day, that's your break even point. All right. So we don't have in in my credit union we don't have a break even point per unit. Why? Because the price is not fixed. In other words, we don't use, give the loan, the same loan to everybody. Everybody has a tailor-made loan. That's that's why it, for a break-even point, it's not there. We have it though, a break-even point in dollars. Now, how do you solve for this? Well, the break-even point in dollars is break-even point X, which is unit, P, which is price per unit, equals fixed cost divided by price per unit minus variable cost times P, price per unit. So, in order to solve the, the, the equation, all you have to worry about is, is the fixed cost divided by one minus variable cost divided by price. And that's, that's how you do the break-even point dollars. Now, do I know my big break-even point X, which is break-even point in units, right? Well, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't in, in the credit union world. If I don't know the price, the, the, the break-even point in units, what I then do right, is the fixed cost for the entire operation right, divided by your price per unit after all discounts minus your variable cost per unit after all discounts times P. I now sub I take away the BEP, F, the BEP or break even point X all right, times your price per unit. And I still use the same formula, but I substitute all the, all the regular. Notice I don't need to know my break even points for, for units in order to calculate break even points for dollars. Because right? all I'm doing is substituting price. That's all. So it's an interesting, interesting uh, dilemma that I face, but it's, it's a good thing. It, makes, it, it forces me to understand these concepts. And at the same time, when my people do the analysis and they present them to me, I know this. Uh, and I expect my people that I, you know, those that I hired that, are, that work for the CFO and work for the CEO, those people are definitely knowledgeable about break-even analysis because I'm asking them all the time. The all the time meetings, every time we hold a board of, this, board of directors meeting, we ask, what is the change of break-even analysis for this month? Why? Because it does change every month. Our rates our rates change monthly. So 
That's why we do break-even analysis on a monthly basis. So if you think that being, when you graduate and get your MBA program out of our university, that, oh, I'll probably never have to do a break-even analysis. Well, that's true for the first few years when you first start doing a job. But then afterwards, as you start growing, you trust me, you're going to start figuring out that, oh, my God, I should have remembered all this stuff and at least take notes and keep them. You will be doing break-even analysis very soon in your career. Now let's talk about profits because you did the break-even analysis. Okay, so how, you know, how do I figure out what the profit is? I said, or what will be the future profits? Well, profit, remember what we said. Profit is total, total revenue minus total cost. So now we substitute these by doing your price per unit minus right, your fixed cost plus your variable cost per unit. When you do all of this and you, substitute, you figure this thing, then you know that it is price minus variable cost times whatever that X function is, right? the X function minus that. When you substitute all that, you get your answer. Now that we taught the theoretical, let's go with a little example. All right. Let us assume that your fixed cost for this operation is 10000 Your materials is $0.75 cents a unit. Your direct labor cost is $1.50 a unit, and your selling price is four, 4 bucks a unit, $4 per unit. When you substitute all this using the bet for dollar, break-even point dollar, you know that your fixed cost divided by 1 minus your variable cost divided by your price equals, you're going to substitute this. What is your fixed cost? 10000 You divide that by, you take 1, and you, you subtract the function of $1.50, which is your variable cost. All right, this is your direct labor cost is $1.50 plus your 75 cents, which is your materials, that's your variable cost, and divide that by four, which is your selling price at $4 a unit. Or it comes out to 10,000 divided by 0.4375 or $22,857.14. Consequently, you then go ahead and let's say you want to figure out what is your break, that's your break-even point in dollars. See, that's what I use. I know that I have to go ahead and make, let us assume here, $22,857.14 in bones every two weeks in order to break even. Now, this is not a true statement. It's a lot more than that. But this is the uh, how, do you, how you review this thing. So if you make less, you know that that particular biweekly schedule, you didn't meet your objectives. You didn't meet the BEP. Now, hopefully your BEP, your break-even point is not your objective. It's higher than the break-even point. You want to make a profit. If you want to do the BEP for X, substituting all of this, and you know it's, it's your, your uh, fixed cost divided by your price minus the variable cost, which when you substitute the numbers I just said, is 10000 divided by $4 minus $1.50 plus 75 equals $5,714. Now let's talk about location and importance of location. And we'll end there uh, with this. When... Remember, in real estate, the mantra is location, location, location. It's the same thing in business. Don't just pick a location because it's the only thing available. You got to pick the location to make sure it's, you know, it's a, it's appropriate for your business. That you actually, it's actually going to make sense for you. One of the most important decisions that your firm is going to be making is ex, you know, spending money on a location because that's a lot of money. It's going to, if you're doing worldwide, you know, you're moving around and you're buying locations worldwide. It's Going to increase your global in, you know global exposure in nature a significant impact on fixed and variable costs because that is your fixed cost and decisions are made relatively infrequent because you're not buying land all the time you're not buying buildings all the time these are long-term decisions and once committed to a location many resources and cost issues are difficult to change the objective of location strategy is to maximize the benefit of location to the firm Options include expanding existing facilities, maintaining existing and add, and add some site, closing existing, and of course you relocate someplace else. It's not working out for you. You close it, you try to sell it, etc. I just saw um, close by where DuPont uh, sold, was closed down one of its uh, sites that was a paint evaluation site. Uh, they closed it down. They didn't need it anymore. And they've been trying to sell that property for, I think, now seven and a half years. It's very tough to go ahead and sell only because it, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's 
contaminated with a whole bunch of uh, chemicals. So they're still trying, but they use some, you know, they're now, they're now renting it out to another firm that is doing construction. As long as you don't dig, they're okay. Locations and cost. Location decisions require careful consideration and you have to do proper analysis because once in place, location related costs are fixed in place and difficult to reduce. Efforts spent determining optimal facility location is a good investment. So what are some of the factors that affect your location decision? Well, globalization adds to complexity. Where in the world are you gonna be moving to? Drivers of globalization include market economies, communications, rapid reliable transportation, ease of capital and capital flows, direct labor cost. And uh, finally, you need to identify key success factor of the organization and the location. The first thing you got to do is country decision. All right, so, and what are the key success factor of that country? You look at, and in my area, we call it the PESTLE. And we have, you know, PESTLE is an acronym, it's, you know, political, economic, you know, et cetera, technical, all of those. Now, you look at political risks, government rules, at, attitudes, et cetera. So is it appropriate for your company? Cultural and economic issues, location of the market, labor, talent, attitudes, productivity, cost, availability of supplies and communication and energy. Is there enough to support you? Exchange rates, don't forget those. All right? Exchange rates and currency risk. And then there's regions by locations. You know, do you want to, you know, conduct operations in the northeast of the United States, in the southeast, in the central, so on. You look at key success factors such as corporate desires, attractiveness of the region, labor availability and cost, cost and availability of utilities, environmental regulations. Do the governments give you an incentive to relocate there? And do they have proper uh, fiscal policies? Proximity to raw materials and your customers. And finally, land construction and cost. So how do you make a site decision? Well, you, there's, a, there's various ways, but one way to look at it is, is how large is your site size and is it adequate for you? Are you close by to air, rail, highway, and water system? What about the zoning restrictions? Are, you know, are there are zoning restrictions that prevent you from doing certain things that you have to do or you would like to do when you do expansion. Proximity to services, supplies are needed, and environmental impact, and customer density and demographics. Right. So I leave you with this. Be careful with your site decisions because, for example, I live in South Florida. So consequently, there's a city called Doral. It is an affluent neighborhood. It is a predominant area hub for a lot of business enterprises. In fact, 60% of its makeup is business-related enterprises. Why is it a, a wonderful place to put a business in? Well, it, it, at the beginning, it was a great place because it is the closest city to the airport that has expansive capabilities. It also is very close to the port of Miami. Consequently, you can have a lot of rail, or not rail, you can have a lot of uh, transport taking place by trucks, right close proximity to the I-95 corridor uh, and the 826 corridor, and it's right there. The airport is literally next to the city. So if the price of the properties escalated to a point now that it is one of one of the most expensive areas to build and to purchase land but if you got it at the right time you made a good a good set of money so timing is everything additionally even though it costs a lot of money location may be what you're looking for so if you want to go into let's say work out of the city uh the city of doral because it is a nexus for international expansion you can actually create your products in the Miami, ship it to the port, or put it into an aircraft and get it out as fast as you can imagine. So it is important to understand facility location is paramount. And with that, I bid you good day.